This evening's scripture reading is from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 9. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of, the, out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's good to be here with you all and have a few visitors that have returned with us this evening. It's really nice to, to have you here and worship with you. I do think it's inevitable, and if it's not inevitable, it's highly likely that each and every person at some point will face rejection in their life. It seems every adult has dealt with devastating rejection throughout their lifetime, whether it's because of your faith or spiritual matters or, or something else entirely, entirely different. In fact, if we think about it, most children have likely dealt with rejection as well as they experienced their first interaction with a bully or are turned down by their first crush. For the adult, the rejections become more serious and painful as we get older. Perhaps you were rejected as a candidate for a major job opportunity for no good reason at all. Maybe someone you love has rejected you with not just their words, but also with their actions. The world has a record of being cruel towards those who deserve it least. It seems the more innocent and pure one is, the less this world and the people in it want you. And so we accept corruption. We accept wickedness in all shapes and sizes. But purity and innocence most want nothing to do with it. Perhaps this is why Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad, which leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. It's easier to be accepted when we go by the the wide, the broad way, because there's more people that are on that path. But we are told of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that we have a Savior who not only sympathizes with our weaknesses, but was tempted in all points as we are, yet, yet blameless. In other words, Jesus faced the same difficulties we have faced and continue to face, including rejection, and therefore can sympathize with us, yet he was blameless. He did not mishandle the situation, as can be tempting to do when we're facing those who reject us, who want nothing to do with us. And while this is true of Jesus... There are actually many who were imperfect, yet righteous individuals who were also rejected as we look throughout the Bible. And we see that it turned out for their benefit. Likewise, there are also individuals who did not handle rejection properly, and it led to their own demise as we look through the Bible. 
And so you'll notice this evening, it's kind of a little different sermon format. We're doing a survey of about six individuals. And you'll notice that these six individuals are people that we're very familiar with. And that was by design because tonight I don't want us to get bogged down into the details of these individuals' lives. I want us to, to look at people that we know. We know their circumstances. We know their story. We know who they were. And yet they're people who all dealt with rejection. And that's what I want us to look at. I want us to look at how these individuals handled rejection and see what we can learn from that. And so we first observed those who were consumed by rejection. And I got to tell you, the first person that I thought of when I was thinking about this was Saul. God rejected Saul as king. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 15. He was told to go in and, and to destroy the Amalekites, destroy their king, destroy the spoil and everything. We saw that he didn't do that. He let the king live and he allowed some of his soldiers to take the, the livestock and some, some of the spoil. And so Saul was rejected as king. But Saul was also rejected by his own people in many regards after this. And this is most evident by the song which is sung in honor of David who had recently slain Goliath. After all, Saul has slain his thousand and David his ten thousand. That's what they sang in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 7. Have you ever felt the rejection that comes with being compared to someone who is perceived as greater than you are? Perhaps you were once considered to be something, only to be displaced an old hat in the eyes of those who once adored you. This was what Saul experienced to an extreme, as he was a king of, of the greatest nation to ever be a nation in the history of our world. And we see that he set himself on a path of self-destruction from that day forward. If you continue reading in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 8, after these people were singing that Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousand, Saul says, or it says of Saul that Saul became very angry, for this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And we go on and we see that from that day forward, Saul eyed David. But all this was indicative of a larger problem. Saul is only experiencing the inevitable consequences of what was already told to him. Again, you look back at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 26. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 26, after he comes back and, and he had not killed the king of the Amalekites. It says that Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. We're talking about rejection of all types. We read right here that God is rejecting the actions of Saul and rejecting him as king. But we see what was he more concerned about. It seems as you fast forward, he becomes more concerned about what the people think rather than what God thinks. What should Saul have done? It's easy to look back in hindsight, but at this point... Saul should have accepted God's rejection of him as king. Accepted that God said that he's no longer fit to be king. Accepted the fact that that is God's will. And he should have given up his crown to David, the anointed king, instead of waiting for a moment where it would have to be taken from him. He should have stopped putting effort in trying to maintain his crown and instead started focusing his efforts and being accepted by God as a man. Because what does 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 26 not tell us? It doesn't tell us that God rejected Saul altogether. It just says he rejected him as the king of Israel. But he became consumed with that, with that rejection. Instead of taking a step back and saying, okay, how can I gain God's favor once again? He had tunnel vision. And we see instead he continued to reject God's authority and his will. 
Most notably as he's trying to repeatedly kill David. And it led to an end which saw him falling on his own sword. Because he mishandled rejection. And I don't know if there's a correlation, but it reminds me of another individual who also suffered a similar end. And that's Judas. Judas is another man who was faced with rejection. We all know the name Judas. His name stands as the ultimate example of bitter betrayal gone horribly wrong as it resulted in the death of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But the thing about it is this. Judas knew, he knew, he had played a role in the condemnation of Christ's innocent blood. And he clearly had regret over the wicked deed he had done. As he should have. Remember, Christ said, woe to that individual. And it would be better for him to not have ever been born than to betray the Son of Man. But from whom did Judas seek acceptance after we see he's been overcome with this remorse? Turn over to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 3. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 3. It says, Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, talking about Jesus, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away, and he hanged himself. Who did, Jesus, or who did Judas seek acceptance from when he felt remorse? And when he realized he made a major mistake? He sought it from the Jews. From mere men who were every bit as guilty as he was. Let me ask you all a question. Would Judas have felt better about his actions had they taken that money back? Had they accepted him? Had they said, it's okay, Judas, you did the right thing? Would that have made Judas feel better? Interesting to think about. But we see clearly that once they rejected his offer, he went out and he hung himself. Putting all of our hope in being accepted by men is a futile one. It's one that has no hope. Because man is just as guilty as the rest of us. And when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to eternity, man has nothing to offer us. All hope rests with God. And to put all our hope in being accepted by man, to do that will make one miserable. As it did with Judas, who rejected Jesus and clearly felt all hope was lost when these men did not receive him back. Let me tell you, all hope was lost when he decided to reject Jesus. When he decided to turn him over for 30 pieces of silver. And finally, we consider Cain. Another man that we're all familiar with as we read that story in Genesis chapter 4. We know the story. Cain and his brother Abel. They both offer sacrifices. God regarded Abel's. He did not regard Cain's. The actions of Cain, when he made that offering, again, God didn't regard him. He, he rejected that offering. And it was unacceptable before God. We see a man dealing with the rejection of God. However, Cain was given a chance. He was given a chance to be better and do better. When God told him what? He said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Genesis 4, 7. But if not, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. He received counsel and advice from God. He'd fallen short, but God was giving him another chance to be accepted. If you do well, you will be accepted. But what did Cain do? Cain resented and rejected God's advice. God's advice. 
as evidence in his actions when he killed his brother Abel. And what was the result? We see the result was God rejected Cain. God rejected Cain and sent him to be a wanderer and a fugitive on the earth. And we see that in Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, 14 through 16. But I want, to, I want to remind us that this is a very basic principle. That if we reject God, he rejects us. That's just how it works. And it's one that we see Jesus even speak to in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Saul denied God's word. We recall it said that Saul rejected the word of the Lord, therefore the Lord rejects him as king. Saul rejected the, Lord, the word of the Lord. Judas rejected Christ when he decided to hand him over for 30 pieces of silver. And furthermore, he was warned. And he rejected that warning. Cain rejected the counsel and advice of God when he killed his brother. We are consumed. We are consumed by rejection when it leads us to reject God. That's what, we, what consumed these men. When they decided to reject God. So the question becomes, how do we overcome it? How do we overcome the rejection? And so I have three more men that I want us to look at who overcame rejection. Perhaps one of the most prominent examples of rejection when we think of Old Testament individuals is Joseph. Joseph is such a prime example of how to handle rejection. As we see, he was rejected on several different occasions. The first time we are, of course, familiar with Joseph's brothers, they, they throw him into a pit and he's sold off to be a slave. The second time was when Joseph resisted Potiphar's wife, and she lied about the situation to Potiphar, which ended with Joseph being thrown in jail despite the fact that he had done what was right. Imagine that, being thrown in jail, being persecuted for doing what's right. Let me ask, what would happen if Joseph had handled his rejection in the same way that these three previous men had handled rejection? Allowing it to totally defeat them and define them. Leading them to reject God in one way or another. I suppose Joseph very well could have said, well, everyone thinks I'm a fornicator and thinks I'm a criminal. Might as well be one. Could have handled it that way. But quite clearly, Joseph didn't care what people thought, at least not completely. He cared about what God thought and continued to rely on him at all times, understanding the fact that God's ways are better and higher than his ways. Therefore, the story of Joseph ends how? Genesis chapter 50 and verse 19. It ends with Joseph embracing his brothers because they're all afraid of what's going to happen once Jacob dies. And they're worried that Joseph's going to deal harshly with them. But Joseph embraces his, his brothers and he says, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph's experience with rejection ultimately led him toward what? Led him towards confidence. 
which is really an opposite result that rejection typically has on the world today. Typically, when we're rejected, it lowers our self-esteem. It lowers our confidence. But for Joseph, it gave him confidence. Although it wasn't a confidence in himself. It was a confidence in God. After he saw how many times he delivered him. How many times Joseph had been rejected, and yet God came through for him time and time again. God accepted him when others rejected him. He relied on God every step of the way. And you know what? We could say the same thing about Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we'll start reading in verse 5. But Samuel also faced rejection. He was the last judge. His life was winding down. The people recognized it. And they demanded a king to take up his mantle. Samuel was too old, too old and all the other nations had kings, so why don't we? That's how the people were looking at it. Samuel was displeased with this, wasn't he? Let's read it in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 5. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, and that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. We see how displeased Samuel was, how, how discouraging this must have been. We can only imagine how he must have reacted, seeing the crowd demanding a king. And Samuel, in his mind, he's thinking, you have a king. Jehovah's your king. Yahweh's your king. And what did Samuel do when he's dealing with this situation? It says that he prayed to the Lord. He prayed to the Lord. And as I read that, it almost seems like that's what he does in the midst of this conversation with the people. It seems they're confronting him about this issue, and he goes into prayer, and he gives it to God. And what did God do? God provided him with wisdom that would carry Samuel through this. They were not rejecting him, but they were rejecting God, as they had always done. He didn't handle the situation like Cain, who ignored the advice and counsel of God. Samuel took God's words to heart. And he did everything he could to make sure he did not become guilty of the same sin that all of Israel had become guilty of, rejecting God as their king. Even if that meant doing what the king couldn't. And I'm, now I'm talking about Saul. Going back, he wasn't willing to kill the king of the Amalekites. And so how did Samuel handle that? He said, fine, give me the sword, I'll do it. Furthermore, he went on to rebuke Saul. Can you imagine that, rebuking the king? But why was it that he did that? Because he rejected the word of the Lord. And his allegiance was to God and not to the king of Israel, not to a man. Samuel made sure that the rejection the people had toward him would not result in his rejection of God. And he died a righteous man. And we know that. But finally, the example that's probably on the forefront of all of our minds is Jesus. And I bring this one up almost as, as more of a reminder. To remind us how much rejection Jesus went through for us. Perhaps one of the most prominent words to describe Jesus' ministry is the word rejection. He was rejected by his town, rejected by his brothers, rejected by his apostles, rejected by Jews, both Sadducees and Pharisees. We could go on and on and on. 
Jesus' life was one that began and ended with rejection. They rejected his deity, his teachings, his claims, his guidance, his works, his appearing. But this is what was prophesied about him. This is what was to be expected. Isaiah chapter 53, that was our, our scripture reading. Isaiah 53, and we'll start in verse 1. Isaiah says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Jesus was rejected by men. And he spent his entire ministry dealing with that. And we ask the question, why is it that he persevered? Why is it that he was willing to be rejected to the point where it resulted in him dying and suffering a gruesome death on the cross. The reason that he endured all that rejection was so that we could be accepted, accepted by God, cleansed from, by his blood. So the question I have, what will we do? Will we do the same? Will we be guilty of the same sin that much of Israel was guilty of at his appearing? Rejecting him, not recognizing him as our Lord and Savior. Or will we accept him so that we too can be accepted before God? And with Jesus Christ in mind, I want us to consider some concluding lessons of rejection. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse, we'll start reading in verse 4. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And keep in mind, Peter is writing to the dispersion. He's writing to formerly Jews, now Christians, who were dispersed. They were rejected from their own communities. And how are they told to handle that? They're told to look at Jesus. He says, And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a, for, a holy, for a holy priesthood, excuse me, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What is precious to God is often rejected by men. But keep in mind, as you go about this world, and we may face rejection, again, for spiritual matters or otherwise. But what we have to realize is that the entire world, without God, are not a people. That's what Peter says. He says, you once were not a people. Without God, we're nothing. But with God, we are a people. With God, we're something. Let me ask another question. If human beings were the ones who determined the worth 
of each and every one of our souls and every soul that ever walked the face of this earth, what would Jesus be worth? I think I'd say he'd be worthless if that's what we were going off of. He'd be worth less than every individual in this room. And yet he was the one that every man should have accepted. The one that each and every individual on the face of this earth that should be accepted is the one who faced the most rejection. One's worth cannot always be evaluated and determined by humans. And if it can, then maybe we're just really bad at it. And I know this isn't antique roadshow. But we've all heard the saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. In the case of Jesus Christ, this was true to the utmost extreme. What man considered to be trash, he was crucified between two criminals. God considered to be precious. So precious, in fact, that he would be the foundation, the very basis of his eternal purpose, the church. We must remember, God determines our worth, not man. So we shouldn't put so much stock and hope into what others think about us. In this life, People have a tendency to ride the highs and lows of what others think about them. And that can produce some pretty great emotional inconsistencies. But with the proper perspective, we should be a people who are even keel. Not becoming too disappointed when people think little of us. And not becoming puffed up when others think highly of us. Why? Because at the end of the day, God determines our worth, not man. Therefore, we'd be foolish to reject God, to reject the man who determines our worth, the being that determines our worth. And I want to, I want to remind us of something. Rejecting God manifests itself in more than one way. Turn over to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. In verse 15, Paul writes to Titus, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. But listen to this. They profess to know God, but their deeds, their deeds, they deny him. Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Perhaps the biggest mistake we can make is assuming that to reject the idea of God which is atheism, is the only way which we can reject God. That's a mistake. Look at the three men that served as a warning tonight. Looked at Saul, we looked at Judas, we looked at Cain. They too rejected God. However, all three were, quote, believers when we're talking about believing in the concept that there is a God. Not believers in how the Bible defines it. Understand that. But they rejected God in other ways. We saw that Cain rejected his counsel and warnings, and we talked about that. Saul rejected God's will. Judas did both. This lesson is more pertinent to believers than it is to non-believers. 
We are told in John 14 and verse 15 that Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, when we don't keep God's commandments, when we willfully reject his commandments, we're saying, I don't love you. And if that's not rejection, I don't know what is. To reject his commandments is to reject him. To add to his word is to favor our ways and reject his. To put something else before him is probably worse than rejecting him altogether. We recall Laodicea. He said, you're lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. With God, we have to be all in and realize that if we're not all in, then we're nothing at all. And why should we expect any different? Was God not all in towards us from the beginning of the world before that? He was all in. He did everything for us. He could have rejected us. But he's given us every single chance to come to him and to be accepted by him. I'm reminded of Brent who told me one time that I think uh, Maurice Estes gave you a book. And on the inside of the cover, it said something to the effect, and I hope I'm not butchering this, but it said on the cover he had written, I love you, not because you're perfect, but because you try. I'm, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And we're going to mess up. We're going to fall short. But we have to try. We have to try. And I want to remind us, if we do that, if we are all in, if we try our hardest, the Lord will receive you if you go to him. In the midst of all the rejection that we may face, God will accept us if we go to him. If we're all in. Turn over to John chapter 6 and verse 33. John chapter 6 and verse 33. Jesus says, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing." But raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. The bread of life is there for the taking. It's there for our taking. So the question is, who will partake? Who will partake of the bread of life that is offered to man through Jesus Christ? Whoever looks on him and believes in him, obeys him, makes him their everything, makes them their sustenance in life, will be raised up on the last day. In other words, if we go to him, he will accept us. But we have to make that choice. And we need to continue to motivate ourselves by what Jesus says here. Again, we face rejection all the time. But what does Jesus says, say? <laughs> he says, I myself will raise him up on the last day. That should motivate us to put up with any rejection we may face in this life. And I have no idea exactly how all of that is going to go down. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he'll call us each by name. Maybe he'll say, Sam, Brent, Vicki, Tim, Ellen, Trevor. 
Maybe he'll call us each by name, or maybe he'll just say, Saints, arise. It's time for me to deliver my church to my Father. That's the thing we should be thinking about when we face the rejection of man. And finally, I want us to remember that God's greatest accomplishment, as far as we're concerned, overcame rejection. His greatest achievement began with rejection, endured rejection, and was completed in the midst of rejection. And even though the plan has been accomplished, and it's the greatest feat of all time, it is still rejected to this day. What was it that required the sacrifice of Jesus to begin with? Man's rejection of his commandment in the garden. And his plan endured all sorts of pushback. As the Israelites were constantly rejecting God in place of something or someone else. He endured that for centuries. Jesus Christ finally came to this earth. And he was vehemently rejected by the majority. Which resulted in his crucifixion. Yet God endured it all. And what is the result for us? What is the result of all that rejection, of God enduring all of that? We could go to a lot of passages, but I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 25, where we see this comparison of the church, and it's, and it's compared to, well, Christ's love for the church is compared to how a husband ought to love his wife. But it says in verse 25, husbands love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. This is God's greatest accomplishment. And it's why it's so crucial that we need to be part of the Lord's church. Christ endured rejection so that we may be accepted by God through his church. Therefore, we must accept God, even if it means being rejected by everyone else. That's the least we can do. And shame on us if we don't. We must not reject God, as it will result in God rejecting us. The rejection of man is nothing compared to the rejection of God. We must appreciate the fact that we have such a merciful God who is long-suffering and eager to accept us if we only choose to accept him. Again, rejection is inevitable in many senses. Facing the rejection of man, that's, I would say that's inevitable. But there is one rejection that does not have to be inevitable. And that's, the, that's God's rejection. We have an opportunity to be accepted by God if we are baptized into his church. And we need to take advantage of that opportunity. So if you're here this evening and you're ready to accept God into your life, don't waste any time. Come forward while we stand and sing or come and talk to us afterwards. If there's a convenient time, if you have any spiritual matters that you need help with, please come forward while we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>